Welcome everybody, uh, the brilliant and talented and um, just awesome Nick Everstaff is here. Um, Nick it has an extraordinary brain and mind and we are so lucky to have him. He is truly a national treasure. Um, uh, the state of the world, the state of our society, the state of the culture um, is concerning, particularly about work and um, men. So I'm just going to turn over to you and why don't you give it around the world and talk about lots of different things. If you have slides, we can share them. If you don't, that's okay. And um, we just have a bunch of questions in the queue already. And before I uh, officially turn it over to you, thank you everybody for joining. Um, the support that you give goes to help people like Nick do their work uh, and help our country be better in all ways. So Nick, take it away. Lisa, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gents, uh, thank you for uh, risking your morning uh, with me. I'll try not to disappoint you too badly. And thank you especially for being interested in the American Enterprise Institute. Um, I've been around the block long enough to know that institutions are terribly hard to build and so easy to destroy. Um, that goes for many other things in our country at the moment, I'm afraid. Um, over the almost 40 years that I've been at AEI, it's been my dream job for a lifetime, um, I have watched a succession of presidents build this institution into, I think, the most exciting and interesting research organization on the forefront of uh, freedom and uh, future for America. And I'm very glad to be part of it. And I think that its own prospects uh, have looked better uh, from decade to decade and year to year. So thank you very much for your interest. Um, <clears throat> I thought maybe, I'd, I mean, I'm happy to talk about anything that you all want to, but I thought that maybe I'd start out by talking a little bit about some of the problems uh, that we're facing in the United States today. Um, I've been on this uh, men without work beat for uh, the better part of a decade. I make my living more or less such as it is by um, uh, finding and pointing out problems that are hiding in plain sight. And back in 19, excuse me, back in 2016, um, I wrote a book called Men Without Work, America's Invisible Crisis. Uh, I stumbled onto this problem a little earlier than that when I was listening to all of this uh, happy talk from the Fed and from uh, the financial community about how America was uh, at full employment or near full employment. And I was reading these uh, public opinion polls where half of the American public thought we were still in a recession. And I was trying to figure out how do you square these things? And um, the way you square them is by having an employment system of statistics that was uh, built to fight the last war. Uh, our existing employment statistics system was designed uh, during the Great Depression and it was intended to measure the Great Depression. Uh, that was a time when if men were out of, uh, out of work, nobody would have imagined that they wouldn't be looking for work. Uh, so the, uh, the, number of, the number of men without work would be more or less equal implicitly to uh, the unemployment rate. In our post-war world, there is a third status for working age men besides employed and unemployed. And this is neither working nor looking for work, the NILF, uh, not in labor force. And if you take a look at the most recent numbers for uh, the jobs report in the United States for, uh, uh, for last month, which just came out uh, last Friday, it shows that for Every prime age man, 25 to 54, still the backbone of the uh, labor force and the economy, uh, kind of important also in uh, helping to form families, uh, raise children. 
um, for every unemployed guy in that grouping, there are almost four guys who are neither working nor looking for work. So if you're just looking at the unemployment rate, you are missing four fifths of the worklessness problem for prime age men in the United States. And if you put all of that together and look at the percentage of guys who are not getting paid work, it's just about the same as it was the first time this was measured by the census of 1940. And that was a time when the US unemployment rate was over 14%, almost 15%. So our, <clears throat> our joblessness problem with, uh, with men in America today um, is kind of a depression scale problem, late depression scale problem. Uh, it's, it's not hy hyperbole to say that. And uh, unlike the uh, you know, unlike the labor market of the 19, early 1940, today we still have a uh, bizarre uh, peacetime uh, labor shortage. It's not as acute, as, I mean, all of you who are employers know it's still pretty acute. It's not as acute as it was um, a year ago, maybe, uh, but almost over 9 million uh, between 9 and 10 million unfilled positions exist in the United States at the same time that uh, almost 7 million prime age guys are on the sidelines of the economy, neither working or looking for work. Um, for, every, uh, for every unemployed person in the United States today, there is about one and a half unfilled slots out there. Um, and it is not that all of these slots, as you know, are for hedge fund managers or chemical engineers. Um, a lot of the jobs are for relatively unskilled labor, or should I say, for labor that has the skill of showing on, uh, showing up on time every day, not stoned. Um, so we've had a tremendous transformation in the American economy and in U.S. society that um, has led us to this juncture. I should say that it, uh, the men without work problem that I have focused on is not, I think, the only um, the only trouble in the labor market that I could uh, point out to you. Um, since the uh, since the COVID pandemic, uh, one of the only bright spots in the American uh, labor market tableau has become considerably uh, more dim, and that was the working uh, the working profile of older Americans of the fifty five plus. Older Americans had been. Uh, increasing their work rates and their labor force participation rates for a generation up to the eve of COVID. Now those have fallen down very, uh, very sharply. They are part of the uh, part of the labor force gap that we're talking about now. You can't explain this um, uh, this drop and flatlining of labor force participation for older Americans. Uh, by fear of the workplace. So we've rolled out vaccines. The uh, pandemic has become uh, endemic. Uh, and you, um, I, th I think you have to look at, uh, I think you have to look at some of the unintended consequences of our COVID relief policies to understand exactly what's gone on there. Uh, during the uh, during the COVID emergency, uh, the Fed and uh, the uh, government unleashed a tidal wave of money and transfers to uh, prevent a second Great Depression. Uh, they were successful in preventing a second Great Depression, but they overshot. Uh, 
And as a consequence, uh, Americans during the years 2020 and 2021 had more money in their pockets, uh, thanks largely to borrowed federal funds that were transferred to households, than they could spend. We doubled our national savings rate during those years. To my knowledge, this is the only national economic crisis in which savings rates <laughs> went up, much less doubled. And uh, a big nest egg was developed on the basis of that. That nest egg is still being spent down. I think that helps us understand uh, why there's been this uh, phenomenon of premature retirement by, and maybe unsustainable retirement by older Americans over the past several years. Uh, two other aspects of the labor market I will mention to you as well. Um, there is there is something on the horizon which kind of is the doppelganger to the men without work problem, and this is a women without work problem. Uh, I, I would say that this is a yellow flashing light, not a red flashing light, but it bears watching. Um, I'm talking in particular about prime age women, 25 to 54, neither working nor looking for work nor in education or training, with no children at home in their, under their same roof, and not presently married. This group has grown exponentially in the United States over the past two generations. And while that men without work group I was mentioning earlier ranks about 7 million, just, just shy of 7 million right now, this women without work group is not trivial in numbers. It's about 3 million. Um, and the reason I'm, uh, I'm a little bit concerned about this is because I look at time use surveys that report, or rather self-report, what people say they do uh, with their day from the time they wake up until they go to sleep and also how long they sleep. Um, labor uh, labor department uses this for all sorts of different reasons, um, this information. Um, the women without work that I'm describing uh, have eerily similar self-reported patterns of time use to the male dropouts from the workforce. Like the male dropouts, they basically don't do worship. They basically don't uh, do uh, volunteering or... Um, charity, do surprisingly little, uh, uh, surprisingly little of uh, the sort of help around the house, help with other people, housework. They do the same sort of things as the male dropouts with respect to watching screens, uh, not as uh, not as uh, excruciating as the men, but a lot. What of staying at home and watching something, watching thing, uh, screens. And like the men, uh, they report a shockingly high, they self-report a shockingly high use of pain medication. Before the, uh, before the pandemic, about half of these dropout guys in one module, the, uh, the, the time use survey did, uh, about half of them self-reported they were taking pain medication every day. Not necessarily prescription, but pain medication every day. That's the same as the women without work that I'm mentioning there. One last thing, and I'll shut up and go wherever you all want to. And this is about younger Americans, uh, 16 to 24. Uh, their, um, their labor force participation rates have also slumped. Um, and it is not just... Um, it's not just increasing educational attainment that is accounting for this. Um, one of the striking phenomena that has occurred in American society over the past two generations has been, let's call it the death of the summer job. Okay. Um, when I was uh, young, uh, shortly after the end of the Stone Age, uh, summer jobs were thin. Um, young guys and girls want to get summer jobs because they put money in your pocket. You got independent of your parents, maybe put it towards school. You could, <laughs> you could kind of uh, establish a, sp a space for yourself with this. 
Um, since that time, uh, the percentage of 15 to 17 year old boys and girls uh, who are in the labor force in July of each year has plummeted from about almost two thirds to barely a quarter. Um, if you're well to do, you're uh, you're likely to be in enrichment. Uh, you might be in remedial, but you're not in the labor force. You know, learning labor force skills. One of the great things about uh, having your first collision with the labor force as a teenager is that whatever attitude adjustments need to occur can happen uh, with at a lot lower cost and a lot easier. We're in a situation now in the United States where many, I think perhaps even, I haven't calculated this, but I think by now maybe even the majority of young men and women are having their first collision with the labor force in their 20s. And that's, uh, that's a lot later. Uh, that's in effect a sort of a prolonged adolescence, uh, which makes, I think, the adjustment process to, the, uh, to being a member of the labor force potentially more costly, potentially more difficult. In any case, why don't I stop here? And I, I do a lot of other things besides this. I, I do stuff on international demographics and on China and on North Korea. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm happy to talk about anything that you all would like to. Thank you. Um, we have two questions that have came in via text. The first is um, you talk, you've talked about mental health in America. How do you see mental health affecting the workplace post COVID. And that's my dog saying hello. So my apologies for the noise in the background. And the second is, um, given the recent news coming out of China, how do you see that? Um, we're, I think every mental health first. Yes, yeah, mental health first. I think everybody is aware that we've got uh, a crisis of loneliness, a crisis of anxiety, a crisis of fear, uh, and it skews young. Um, the um, the the, uh, the the Gen Z group uh, is afraid of their own shadow. I mean, I, I talk to Gen Z people all the time. I mean, they're, they're afraid of committing in a romantic relationship. They're afraid of work. They're, some of them are afraid of the future of the planet. Uh, and it's remarkable that uh, the generation of Americans that's um, more prosperous, better educated, in some ways better placed than any before, should be so lonely and fearful about the world. Um, there are probably a lot of reasons for this. Um, this is a big one. Uh, it's an, it is a living, living an alternate life inside a machine, I don't think is a good way to go. Now, that does not entirely explain America's mental health epidemics. Obviously, there's a huge amount of pain out there. That's what some of this self-medication that I was referring to is all about, clearly. Uh, China. Um, I cannot prove this to you yet, yet, but I suspect there is an immense change underway in the People's Republic of China. Uh, and that change is a radical shift in national mood towards deep, severe pessimism. Um, when I look at population numbers for China, um, my spider sense goes off because the dictatorship run by the CCP uh, imposed this awful one-child policy from really the late 1970s until about 2015. It didn't force everybody to have only one child, but it was a coercive antenatal program uh, that had enormous unintended consequences. The government suspended it. It did not end it. It only suspended it because the government maintains its uh, claim that it is the ultimate arbiter of how many uh, babies should be born in that country. It suspended it in 2015 because they thought that they could fine tune the birth rate. Instead of going up 
since the end of the uh, enforcement of that program, birth rates have plunged. They started plunging before uh, COVID. They continued plunging during COVID. In the past six years in which data have been reported, China's birth total dropped by half. To give you, a, you know, a scale to measure that sort of a plunge, during the famine that now created, births dropped by about 40%. So, so this is a bigger drop than, this is a bigger drop than war. This is a bigger drop than a famine. Uh, something immense is going on, I think, in the mentality of China. And I think it's, it reminds me very much of when I was a young guy and I was following the Soviet Union during the Cold War. There was a brilliant article that uh, a historian who had spent time as a Fulbright scholar wrote in the late 70s uh, as a young guy, John Bush now, wrote a piece called New Soviet Man Turns Pessimist. And that's what happened in the late 60s and in the 70s and late Soviet, uh, late Soviet times, it went on into the 80s. Uh, when new Soviet man turned pessimist, I'll be a little bit oversimplistic, you know, uh, pessimism with Russian characteristics was to drink yourself to death. And the Soviet Union uh, suffered a health crisis at the same time as this uh, tremendous change in national mood. I don't think that, I don't think that a severe pessimism with Chinese characteristics is going to look the same, but it means uh, the end of a lot of families uh, it means uh, a flight from marriage. Uh, it, I think is going to mean a much more brittle society and economy. Uh, and if I'm correct, um, it's going to constrain Chinese Communist Party leadership in ways that they may not understand yet. So uh, that's I can't prove this to you yet. I can tell you the. the the birth rate is plunging and the um, marriages are, uh, marriage rates are plunging as well. Uh, doesn't look very much like a Confucian tradition society. Thank you. Uh, we have a bunch of questions. Um, the first comes from Bill Koch in Indiana, or I'm sorry, Bob Koch in Indiana. Bob, you want to ask your question? Sure. Hey, um, in that not in the workforce group, does that include unreporting household workers, uh, lawn lawn guys, uh, <clears throat> freelance workers, and people like that? That's a great question. Um, thank you for asking it. Um, we have the in principle problem here. And the in principle problem is in principle, any paid work uh, that a person surveyed um, did during the uh, during the week of the week of survey during the month that they're doing the job report is supposed to be uh, accounted for and uh, makes you a worker. Doesn't matter if you're an independent contractor, doesn't matter if you're a moonlighter, doesn't matter if you're a gig economy person, it all is supposed to count. Now, what is uh, what is not clear is, for example, how many people who are receiving disability payments are actually doing a little bit of something on the side, you know, roofing, you know, whatever. Um, the IRS is very interested in this question, uh, not surprisingly. Um, the uh, since it is an unmeasured, uh, unreported, or perhaps incorrectly reported uh, phenomenon, you know, people try to guess about this. And uh, a former head of the uh, BLS, uh, Catherine Abraham, Bureau of Labor Statistics, has kind of made a made a little you know uh, foray into this, and the her conclusion uh, is that, of course, it does exist, but we're not talking about huge numbers of people, and we're also not talking about huge amounts of unreported labor. More like, I mean, I think the way that she would, these are my words, not her, I think she would say it's more like, you know, kind of like pin money for going to Red Lobster rather than buying a second home. 
Thank you. Uh, Victoria, do you want to read your question that was texted in? Yeah, it's a two-parter question. So the first part is, um, you know, where do we go from here channeling Jay Forrester? It's all a big interconnected system, so we can't just poke one issue at a time, which um, I agree. Um, and then how does the U.S. eventually self-correct, or are we way past the kind of corrective policy time? Oh, I don't, I don't think we're at all past a, a tipping point. I mean, uh, you know, I don't, I don't believe that history is linear. Uh, I, I, and I don't believe that it's, you know, uh, I was a Marxist when I was very young, but I did not believe in uh, material determinism at this point. I think human agency matters a whole lot and values matter a whole lot. Um, and motivations matter a whole lot. Um, in, in immediate terms about this men without work problem, there are things that we can't do. Um, if if I were um, no, let's see, if I if I were God uh, and I had God's wand, the first thing that I would do to fix the men without work problems, I'd fix the family in America. But um, no president can do that. No Congress can do that. Um, so we have to work with uh, the buttons that policymakers and the options that people in civil society really have. So what are those options? Um, more skills, more, especially more vocational skills. It's a, uh, it's a shame and a scandal that so many young Americans graduate uh, from high school without a skill that can support them uh, in the workforce and uh, help them get a home and a family. Uh, you know, it's revealing, it's a kind of revealing of the, to me, of the corruption of uh, the big ed establishment that you know, they kind of give you the stink eye if you even use the word vocational nowadays. That word isn't supposed to be used it's like oh it's always a career and technical you know? but we all know what it means there's a lot of skills that uh people don't have that can help them make a good living without getting a college degree and we need to have a lot more of that we need to in my view uh scrap our archipelago of disability benefit programs and start again from scratch um, you know, they were all established for um, good reasons, noble reasons that people could be protected who couldn't who couldn't work, but they have um, metastasized into this archipelago of um, disincentivizing programs that um, uh, encourage helplessness and dependence. Um, I wouldn't think that Americans would always look to Sweden for examples of things to do right, but after uh, the Swedish uh, financial crisis of the 1990s, when the Swedish government ran out of other people's money, they redid their uh, welfare state with a work first principle. I kind of like the work first principle. It might turn out to be more expensive, actually, but I think its unintended consequences uh, would be a lot more limited and I think we, we might all be a little bit better off as a society with something like that. Uh, the third thing that I mentioned is um, uh, felons. Uh, we have about 25 million uh, people with felonies in their backgrounds in America today. Almost no information about them. There's a, uh, a huge invisible population in the United States. Maybe one in seven adult men has a felony uh, conviction in his uh, CV, so to speak. Um, until we pay more attention to this gigantic population, trying to figure out who can be um, who can be brought back into the workforce, who can repair their employment reputation, who can come back into families. Um, we're going to um we're going to have a huge gap with uh with men and and the second part of the question was kind of more generally i guess about writing uh things in our country uh well you know we, we've only got like 10 more minutes so we're not going to go through all of that but one point i'll make is that i think 
a lot of people who would call themselves conservatives, uh, including a lot of my friends, are fighting the last war. You know, when I grew up, the biggest threat to freedom was uh, communism, was international communism. And after the collapse of the Soviet uh, empire, I would have said that the biggest threat to freedom in the United States was Leviathan. And uh, I am not discounting the uh, threat of the Chinese Communist Party or discounting the threat of Leviathan to American freedom. But uh, the, the newest threats to freedom in America, I think, are kind of, um, you know, uh, Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci, Frankfurt School, uh, the Continentals. It's the march through the institutions by the enemies of the open society to capture the commanding heights of our culture. And we see this in universities, needless to say. We see this in the media, which have turned from being the sort of biased outlets that I knew as a young man to actually kind of agitprop organizations these days. Uh, we see it in the HR department of so many private businesses. Um, and needless to say, we see it everywhere in the social media. Um, we don't even have the language for describing the erosion of freedom that we have suffered in recent years due to these enemies of the open society and their long march in our country. We don't have a game plan for how to go back and undo this. Um, it looks to me kind of like we're gonna to have to be at Stalingrad, you know, kind of house to house combat to retake uh, free society. But, um, other people who are better than me may have better ideas about this. We have people at AEI who are working on this. And one of the things that it really takes, you know, I'm an old guy. Uh, I don't have much to be afraid about. But if you are a young man or a young woman and you're raising a young family, there are a lot of ways that people can come after you today that they wouldn't have with me 35 years ago. Well, I'm thoroughly depressed now. <laughs> um, thank you for that very candid um, statement about the state of our country. Um, we have a bunch more questions. Are you okay going an extra five minutes? An extra five, yeah. I've, I've got to go give a talk down at Cato, uh, but I can do an extra five. Thank you. Um, next question comes from Bill Kunkler. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and, and thank you, Nicholas. Um, very quick question. In your research, do you see any difference in within the United States? I mean, I live in Chicago. I look at this as a very hostile um, area for business and you know work and formation. And so we're leaving um, certain neighborhoods. You just don't even want to go there, and and government isn't really there to help help uh, support the formation of business. So it's really a red state, blue state thing. Do you see a, a, a difference? Sure, of course. I, I don't need to tell you that. Yeah. Um, one of the curious things I see, this is again in the kind of hiding in plain sight, is the enormous variations within states in labor force participation. Uh, I put out something it's on the AEI website, you know, on my little web page called The Geography of Work earlier this year. About, about three quarters of the variation in labor force participation rates uh, in the United States nowadays are within states. It's not like Appalachia versus the rest or Rust Belt versus the rest. Uh, there are things that are going on within states which um, really surprise me. And because I would have thought, for example, that you know, given the tax uh, regimen and regulation regimen in Illinois, I would have thought there'd be it would be kind of like universally depressed. But there are big, big differences, and um, I don't think that 
I don't think that re I know that I haven't looked at this enough, and I'm pretty uh, sure that the Guild of Labor Economists need to look at this a whole lot more to understand this better. Thank you. Bill, uh, this might be a future topic for you to write about. Um, maybe we can send him some information for the future. Um, our next question comes from Rudy. Rudy, you want to ask your question? Sure. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Victoria. And Nick, thank you for talking to us. I wasn't sure. I know we don't have much time, but maybe talk a little bit about, so I ask you about Korea and um, any demographical or security concerns you have. Maybe I know Kim and Putin are talking about weapons going to Russia for Ukraine? Um, the, you know, the North Korean government uh, is in many ways hard to understand, but in some ways very easy to understand. Because despite all of the strategic deception, they've had one idea for three generations of dictator. And that idea is to break the US-South Korean alliance, get America out of Asia, and absorb the South unconditionally. It sounds nuts if I tell you this, um, but if you look at what they do, everything they do is consistent with this mm -hmm. as top priority. And that's what the nuclear march is, and that's what the nuclear subs are now, and that's what the long range missiles are, is to point a pistol at Uncle Sam's head to make him blink in a showdown eventually and to get out of there. Uh, they seem really to think that if they're just two cats in the bag on the Korean peninsula, they'll win because despite all of their disadvantages, they believe that the South is gutless and pampered and won't fight. They may not be right, but they may be right. Um, this situation with Russia and North Korea is remarkable. I mean, 25 years ago, would it have been possible to imagine that the Russian army would need munitions from the North Korean defense sector? I mean, I mean it's it is a sign of uh, it is a sign of the weakness of both of these conventional forces. Uh, Russia is in, I've argued elsewhere, you can find it on my uh, scholars page, is in long-term decline, uh, not just shrinking population, but human capital, their health, their um, poor educational skills, the lack of knowledge production. I'm doing a uh, I'm doing a lecture later this uh, later this month called uh, which I'm going to call the power of demography and the fate of East Asian states. Mm. And um, I'm not a demography is destiny boy because I believe in human agency as I mentioned mm. before. But the demographic trends underway um, make the future of the United States vis a vis the East Asian states look pretty compelling and even more compelling than the future of the United States versus East Asia is the future of NAFTA land. If you, if you put together Canada and the USA and Mexico, despite all of its horrible drug, crime, corruption problems, Mexico's undergone a health and education revolution. If you put those three guys on a baseball team, there's no place in the world that's going to be able to compete with it over the next couple of generations, I don't think. Amazing, thank you so much. Our uh, next question comes from Nick, or from um, Adam Packard. Adam? Uh, hi, Nick, thank you for being here with us. Um, one of the reasons that we worry about men without work is that lower prime age participation constrains economic growth and birth rate decline does as well. I've read some of your work on that over the years and wonder if you could touch on that. What steps should we be taking right now? What steps should we not be taking right now to reverse that trend? I don't, thank you for asking that. Um, I don't think that pronatal policies are very successful. Um, th there's a big debate about that in our little demographic profession. Uh, I'm on the side that's pretty skeptical about that. I tend to think that the most important factor in uh, levels of fertility or changes in fertility are um, desired family size, the number of kids that women want. Um, so I'm I'm skeptical that we 
Of, there are good reasons for family-friendly policies they, that those win on their own merits. I don't know how much of an impact that's going to have on birth numbers. I mean, the um, the big drop in American uh, fertility since uh, the crash of 08 or the election of Obama, whichever you want to mark it by, um, that has had to do with the change in attitudes on the part of uh, younger Americans. And until there is more confidence and more optimism about the future and more patriotism, you know, this kind of bundle of values that always seems to track very strongly with, um, with birth rates in uh, rich countries, until that mentality changes, I don't think there's that much we're going to be able to do to turn this around. Thank you. Um, so the final question that was texted in is, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of our country? Uh, I'm optimistic. Uh, I think we're in a bad patch. I think we're in a very bad patch. But um, <laughs> uh, uh, compared to what? compared to whom there's no other team that I would want to be on and I don't think that if you're if you're a you know a betting person I don't think there's any other team anybody else uh, would want to be on than the United States of America we have been living through an abnormal uh, historical period this end of the Cold War period for the last 30 years um yeah, you know um it's like People thought power politics doesn't, you know, doesn't exist anymore. It's like uh, we we've had this long spate where we thought that money was free. Um, I mean, all of this is kind of dream world stuff, and it's been consistent with a period of a long spate of very subpar political leadership as well. All of this is unsustainable, and because it is unsustainable, it will not be sustained. So I'm, I'm optimistic. Count me as an optimist. Well, that seems like a great place uh, to end today's call uh, on that positive note. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, we are right at time, 845, so we didn't need that extra five minutes. Um, Nick, you're going to be back for coffee and conversation. Thank you, everybody, for joining and for your engagement with AEI. Your support of AEI makes all of this possible. Uh, Victoria, do you want to share who we have coming up in two weeks? Yes. So two weeks from now um, at 8 a.m. Central, uh, we'll be joined by Adam White. He's the senior fellow at AEI. So his research focuses on um, an analysis on the Supreme Court, the administrative state, American constitutionalism. Um, we'll be talking about all things Supreme Court, recent rulings, um, maybe his take his take on kind of the interpretation of the U.S. Constitution and today's political climate. I mean, all topics, not off limits. So um, looking forward to that conversation two weeks from today. I think he's fantastic, by the way. If you guys are in for a treat, if you stick around for Adam. <laughs> Thank you. And um, we are sharing these on our YouTube channel, um, dedicate it's AEI's YouTube for coffee and conversation. Um, when we send out the reminder for Adam, we will, and uh, we'll also send out today's recording. We'll include a link to that. So you can not only see this one, but you can see all the other ones we have done. Um, we're gonna be heading into our fourth year in January and we'll be coming out with the um, 2024 schedule. So. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Great seeing you. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you all.